Um, and my thought that we're starting late on the announcements. We are so happy to have with us the, the Reverend Mike Bowers today. And I see some of his family here. We welcome you as well. It's good to have you with us. Um, Mike has been in our pulpit a few times. He's a friend of our church and just a welcome pastor. I always enjoy the messages that he brings to us, and I'm sure you will as well. Announcements are in your are in your bulletin. I think that the the, the uh, most important the the most unusual one in there is to remind you that we are having a potluck dinner next Sunday. So we hope that you and many others will come next Sunday prepared to gather with us downstairs. We will supply, I think it's in your, do you have an insert? Yes, thank you Amanda. You have an insert about that. So probably all the information you need. If you've been with us 50 years or this is your first time visiting with us, please come. We welcome you. If you find that you can come, but you can't quite find time to bring something, don't worry about it, there'll be food there, okay? Um, your other inserts, we're still gathering information for the new online directory that Luana is putting together for us. If you haven't had your picture taken, if you hang out afterwards, Luana will get your picture back there in the North X. Um, thank you for that. And Bill has, in, has included a little information about food pantry and how we can support it a little better. More about that next week. <coughs> Are there other announcements? Anybody, anything? Let us prepare our hearts for worship. <laughs> Know each 
each other and to accept each other and to welcome all. We belong to God and through God and to one another. So may our hearts be as one and let us worship our God. your 
goodness, O oh God, you have called us to be your church. You have inspired within us a desire to seek you and to be near you. And in so doing, we find ourselves near each other. And so we gather together in this place at this time to call upon your name, holy as you are, in our humble way to boldly come before you and make a petition at your throne. We're troubled. We're frightful. Some are lonely. Some are hurting. Some are hungry. Lord, we pray your blessings upon these gifts, that they may go places we don't know, that they meet people that we don't know, and that they may witness to our love for you through our love for others. In the name of Christ, amen. Amen.
you come to the church today expecting to be uplifted and encouraged and joyful, if you hadn't gotten it by now, this is probably not going to be your lucky day. <laughs> because the text that we're reading today is a troubling text. It's a text that, well, frankly, makes no sense. There's no redemptive goodness in the scripture we've, that, this, that the lectionary has chosen for us today. Before I go any farther, I want to thank Joe for inviting me to preach on such a terrible text. <laughs> I don't know what it is about uh, vacationing pastors, but they always seem to call on me when the text is especially challenging. And this text is about the death of John the Baptist, a totally senseless beyond meaning death. Uh, to set it up, I need to tell you the story of John the Baptist. You know it, but it, it kind of is in bits and pieces throughout the Gospels, mostly in Luke, but also in Matthew and, and Mark. There is information about John the Baptist. You remember the story of, of ancient Zechariah and Elizabeth, oh, well into their age, uh, older couple who had been unable to have children. Zechariah was a priest and he was active in the temple of his day, but he had always eagerly been waiting and looking for and anxiously awaiting the coming of, of the person who would proclaim the coming of the Messiah, who would, who would announce the incoming of the kingdom of God. He was anxious for that to happen, to, to, just to be able to see that person who would announce that glorious event. Zechariah was uh, going about his duties there in the temple one day and of a routine manner, I suppose, when he was inside the Holy of Holies all alone, and, and all of a sudden he was visited by an angel Gabriel who uh, said, Zechariah, guess what? Well, he didn't talk exactly that way, but something like that. Guess what? You're going to see, you're going not just to see the person to proclaim the kingdom of God, you're going to be the father of the of a son who will announce the coming of the Messiah. Zechariah kind of was surprised because you know, like I said he was he was old older than even me. Old and his and his wife was old as well, and well beyond childbearing age. And so Zechariah just kind of started looking around in the temple to wonder who was Gabriel talking to. And Gabriel points out that it was he who was going to be the father of the coming one. So Gabriel says, how, how can I know for sure? I, 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 this can't be so. I'm too old. My wife's too old. It's just it's, it's not going to happen. And Gabriel promised uh, Zechariah, well, you will be unable to speak until what I have told you comes true. And all of a sudden, Gabriel couldn't speak. For nine long months, he could not speak until the birth occurred. And then he was able to proclaim the, the joy of 
being able to look upon the one who would announce the coming of the Messiah. A lot of hopes were placed on the shoulders of little John. Zechariah's hopes, Elizabeth's hopes, the hopes of the community that raised him and that brought him to uh, adolescence and into adulthood. There were lots of hopes resting on his shoulders. That perhaps they were hoping he would go off to priest school and follow in the footsteps of his father. Apparently didn't have much use for higher education and he he decides to go out on his own probably had been coached about his destiny as a child special child designated for a particular purpose in their community in the world he probably felt the weight of that expectation placed upon him so he went out into the wilderness, adapted a lifestyle of meager existence, living on locust and wild honey, wearing a, a cape of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist. And he would make incursions into town occasionally preaching and proclaiming the kingdom of God. Preaching a baptism of repentance, encouraging everyone, it's time, the time is coming, the Messiah is coming, the time is now to come and change your life and to be cleansed of your sin and to be brought closer to God, his preaching began to attract attention, not just among the people who were eagerly listening for his word, because there were people who were hungry for that kind of hope, that even they could be forgiven of their sin and be welcomed as worthy to be followers of God. And so his reputation grew. It grew among the religious people, the ordinary people, and of course the authorities. One of those authorities was Herod. Uh, Herod got to hear him preach Apparently, he was familiar with John the Baptist and the words he said and the things he, he proclaimed. Uh, but, but he also was kind of skittish and afraid of John uh, because John was not shy about confronting him. The great Herod about his lifestyle, married as he was to his brother wife, whom he uh, married after forsaking his own wife, uh, he, he was condemned by John. But that's not right, John said. It's not, not uh, good for you to be married to your brother's wife. Well, that it didn't bother him too much, but it did bother his wife, uh, Herodias. And that's the story that is told in this reading. We'll read it in a moment. But you need to know where the story comes. The story is told in Mark's Gospel as a flashback. Uh, this is how it happened back there when John was killed. And it comes in the sequence of events in Mark's telling of Jesus' story. It comes in the sequence of the events where Jesus had been going out and proclaiming the kingdom of God, had been 
uh, healing and performing miracles. He had been teaching and gathering around him his disciples. He had been himself become somewhat of a, uh, of a celebrity traveling preacher. And he had gathered enough disciples around him and had taught them enough to where he had thought, he had determined that it was time for them to go out. So he divided them up two by two, sent them out to be proclaiming the kingdom of God. Then this story comes, and after the story is told, the disciples come back and celebrate their success as they went out on their, mer their missionary uh, uh, journey. <clears throat> so Mark places this story strategically at a time when there's kind of an interlude. And it's a story that makes no sense. King Herod heard of it, that is, of Jesus. King Herod heard of it, for Jesus' name had become known. Some were saying, John the baptizer has been raised from the dead, and for this reason, these powers are at work in That word power, in Greek, it's, it's, the, it's the Greek word that is translated dynamite. So the dynamite was in was at work in him. But others said, it is Elijah. And others said, it's a prophet, like one of the prophets of old. But when Herod heard of it, he said, John, whom I beheaded, has been raised. For Herod himself had sent men who arrested John, and bound him, and put him in prison on account of Herodias, his brother Philip's wife, because Herod had married her. For John had been telling Herod, it is not lawful for you to have your brother's wife. And Herodias had a grudge against him and wanted to kill him. But she could not, for Herod feared John, knowing that he was a righteous and holy man, and he protected him. When he heard him, he was greatly perplexed, and yet he liked to listen to him. But an opportunity came when Herod, on his birthday, gave a banquet for his courtiers, his officers, and leaders of Galilee. And when his daughter Herodias came in and danced, she pleased Herod and his guests. And the king said to the girl, ask me whatever you wish, and I will give it. And he swore to her, whatever you ask me, I will give you even half of my kingdom. And she went out and said to her mother, what should I ask for? She replied, the head of John the Baptizer. Immediately she rushed back to the king and requested, I want you to give me at once the head of John the Baptist on a platter. The king was deeply grieved, yet out of regard for the king, out of regard for his oaths and other guests, he did not want to refuse her. Immediately, the king sent a soldier of the guard with orders to bring John's head. He went and beheaded him in the prison, brought his head on a platter, gave it to the girl. Then the girl gave it to her mother. When his disciples heard about it, they came and took his body and laid it in the tomb. Somewhere in here is contained the Word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. I don't know. It's a tragic story. A story that is really kind of frightening. Kind of. Here's a drunk. split up after uh, the death of 
Caesar's death, the the kingdom was split up, and he was the leader of one of those quadrants there in Galilee, and so he calls himself a king, and he's boastful as as this party is going on and this dance is occurring, and so he gets kind of cocky and offers to give away half his kingdom to this girl who danced so pleasingly for him and his guests. And he offers to give her whatever she wants. I don't know what possessed her to go ask her mother, but she did go ask her, what should I ask for? She says. And her mother has her own agenda to get rid of the person who had ridiculed her for being in the relationship with Herod. I want you to ask for the head of John the Baptist. Without hesitation, without waving around and saying, well, I don't know, Mom, I, I don't know if he said anything, but maybe he could give me a new chariot and a team of horses. Maybe I could get something good. She didn't do that. She went immediately, immediately it said, she went back and told the king, I want you to bring me the head of John the Baptist on a platter. That on the platter thing, that was her part. Her mother didn't say anything about that. So she must have been kind of into this too. Whatever the reason, John loses his life to a vindictive wife and a drunken Herod. I'm, I'm waiting for somebody to tell me that it makes sense. It makes no sense. This senseless killing, murder, Disciples of John, you have to know that in John's day, during his life, he was much more well known and perhaps more popular than was Jesus. They grew up together, you know, little cousins or some sort of kin, because Elizabeth and Mary were were related in some fashion, and and so John and Jesus kind of grew up together a few months apart in age, and, and so they knew one another's stories. And so it was at another place in Luke's Gospel, the story of Jesus, of John's arrest and his killing was reported to Jesus. Jesus when hearing that about his friend, you would think he would have, well, like we do, he would have made some famous statement that would have somehow redeemed the death of John the Baptist, somehow brought him and made it have some meaning. But no, Jesus didn't do that. You know what he did? Jesus got into a boat and went to a place of solitude. Jesus sat with the pain of having senselessly lost his friend. Jesus mourned the loss of his cousin. We don't know the details of how that went and what kind of emotions may have been flowing through Jesus' heart at the, at the knowledge of John's death. Because he had, he and John had kind of worked side by side since the time John had baptized him. And John, Jesus kind of went on his way and John continued. 
continued on his way. But when John was arrested, Jesus was called. And John's disciples went, was told, John asked his disciples to go ask Jesus, are you the one or should we wait for another? There he was in prison. the one, to announce the one who would be the Messiah. So all we know is that John's death occurred in a deep dungeon in a prison at the hands of a vindictive leadership when he was full of doubt about the purpose of his life. So if you wanted to get some encouragement out of the scripture for today, you probably need to pull up some uh, different version on, on your phone and, and read another passage, any passage other than this, and you'll probably find some encouragement. But there is probably some ways we could look at this passage and imagine that perhaps there's some redeeming quality last statement where the disciples of John were bold enough, courageous enough to go and ask the authorities for the body so that they could give the body a decent burial. That may have some redeeming quality that, that somehow John's disciples were faithful to him. But somehow God was not faithful to John. God allowed this terrible tragedy to occur. It's like somebody said, God, if this is the way you treat your friends, no wonder you have so few of them. <clears throat> you could say that perhaps the story has within it a kernel of, of what happens when power overtakes a person and that power is exerted over people who are powerless like Herod and his people. You could say that that text is some illustration of, of what occurs when power gets out of balance. You could say that it's a reminder of how John the Baptist was bold enough to speak truth to that power, even in the likelihood that he would be in prison and maybe even ill for that speaking. You could say that there were other redeeming qualities of this text. But I ask you, don't try to convince me that it makes perfect May we stand and affirm our faith. We believe in God, who has created and interested, who works in others and us to the Spirit. We follow the way of Jesus, celebrating God's presence, living with respect to creation, loving and serving others, seeking justice, and resisting injustice.
now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ and the love of God and the fellowship and communion of the Holy Spirit bless, preserve, and keep us now and forevermore. Amen.